sports nutrition. It hasn't always been about energy gels, bars and electrolytes. Oh no, it's come a long way, a seriously long way. And you won't believe some of the crazy stuff that athletes used to fuel themselves with in races such as the Tour de France a hundred years ago. In this vid, it's time for retro versus modern nutrition. Morning. Let's start with the beginning of the day and breakfast. Now, one of the most popular breakfasts for cyclists in the world right now is a massive bowl of porridge. Many of the world's top cyclists will eat a bowl of porridge before setting out on a ride or race or something similar, such as muesli, or if you're in America, oatmeal, um, or other grains, quinoa if you're feeling particularly middle class, or perhaps some rice and omelets are a popular choice too. Generally speaking, riders will consume something that's high in carbohydrate with some healthy fats and some protein in there too. I'm all about porridge. It's my personal favorite thing to eat before a ride. And you can keep it interesting by mixing it up with some banging toppings and get some micronutrients as well. Nice. And of course, I'll be washing this down with a nice cup of coffee. Very popular these days. But let's roll back the clock and see what the cyclists used to eat in the, the retro days. Right, my retro kit, complete with my uh, tub wrapped over my shoulders. Now, the first thing I can do is well, get rid of the, uh, the cup of coffee because coffee wasn't widely drunk pre-race until around 1985 when the first studies were published demonstrating it to be an ergogenic aid. Let me get rid of that and the banana because meat was key. Meat was thought to give you energy. And you can kind of see why they thought that. I mean, lions and cheetahs eat almost exclusively meat, and a lot of it, and, and I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty fast. Consequently, into the 60s, riders such as Eddie Merckx would regularly have light breakfast of cheese and ham, and then would follow that up with a slightly more substantial breakfast of steaks. And not just one steak either, as, as many as six. Merckx wasn't alone either. It would have been common for cyclists up until the 1960s to eat something like this for breakfast and probably also accompany it with a nice glass of red. In the early days of the Tour de France, in the early 1900s, riders drank a ridiculous amount of alcohol before, during and after a stage. And uh, by the way, if you think that this plate looks rather bear, apart from the steak on it, well that's deliberate because it was thought that any accompanying seasoning or sauces that could be added to your steak would irritate the vital organs and so they were avoided. It doesn't end there though because, well, cyclists used to also have a pre-race cigarette to, uh, well, you know, help warm up the lungs. I'm, uh, I'm not going to indulge in a, in a pre-race cigarette because uh, I only smoke when I'm on fire. Heading out on our ride in the present day, and what are we going to take? Well, pro cyclists in the modern era will typically have bidons or water bottles filled with water to stay hydrated, but perhaps also some electrolyte in there as well to help replenish the minerals you lose from sweat, and carbohydrate-based energy powders as well to keep the glycogen levels topped up as you're burning through it. We'll also have a combination of probably bars, energy bars, uh, bananas still remain common, and flapjacks and rice cakes are very popular amongst the pro peloton now, again, to keep those glycogen levels topped up as you're burning through it. And then further on into a race, riders will often consume gels as they're a very fast and quick release source of carbohydrate and caffeine gels as well to give you that extra ergogenic boost deeper into a race. But I'm gonna head out on a ride with a musette filled with retro goodies to, uh, to demonstrate just how different they used to fuel back in the day. I'm now out on my ride and I've got my musette, my nose bag full of my retro tasty treats, but I'm not allowed to start tucking into it yet. I've got to wait until at least 100 kilometers into my ride. Why? Because that's the way they used to do it back then. The reason for this? Well, it was just kind of de rigueur. That was 
just the kind of way they decided they did it. There wasn't a, a scientific rationale behind it, really. Modern science has taught us that we can fuel while on the bike in much more effective ways than that. So riders who are doing the Tour de France in the modern era, they'll typically be eating 20 grams of carbohydrates every 20 minutes, little and often, to keep the glycogen stores topped up. And the reason we know this, the reason why they do this, is because a lot of top athletes they do physiological studies, gas exchange experiments in labs, which can actually measure the amount of CO2 they're breathing out and the amount of oxygen they're taking in, and therefore calculate, based on the intensity of the exercise, the exact amount of carbohydrate they're burning through. Modern riders will typically get their carbohydrate from a combination of sources. So energy powders dissolved in drinks, rice cakes are really popular, little panini sandwiches, and also gels and bars. But I'm gonna pull over at the side of the road now so I can show you what I've got in my retro bag. Well, first up in my uh, bag of goodies, in this, in this foil packaging here, I've got something that was very popular in early editions of the Tour de France the lamb chop. I've uh, got four, four of these bad boys wrapped up here in tin foil. They probably would have used muslin or something similar to wrap theirs, but uh, there you go. I mean, they're not raw, they're, they, are, they are cooked. Um, be interesting seeing how I get on eating those on the bike in a sec. But uh, I haven't just got my lamb chops. I've also got a steak as well. Um, Again, very popular food. Right up until the 1960s, riders loved eating steak. Also got a banana in here. Riders were photographed eating bananas in 1926, and they remain a popular food by riders now. So, you know, some things, they don't change. Also, the little ham and cheese paninis I've got in here. I well, I'll find those. Here it is. So this is a little brioche roll that I've simply uh, wrapped up and filled with ham and cheese. Now this is actually something that, again, riders still do eat today, but was still popular, you know, sort of 60, 70 years ago. But you're probably wondering, what am I gonna drink? <laughs> All right, we're getting on to my favorite part. I'm gonna save that surprise for later. <laughs> right, let's see if I can, uh, see how I get on eating a steak. I'm, I'm riding along. This is really not what you want to be eating. I mean, this is just sitting in my stomach. I feel quite heavy. Just we it's weird as well having a cold steak. Something else not to underestimate is the convenience of modern packaging. You know, things such as gels and bars are so much more convenient to have in your pocket than a steak. And also, the modern water bottle, the ergonomics of the modern water bottle with the, the cap that can be pulled open with your mouth and they can easily be passed from a team car to a rider or from one rider to the other and they slot seamlessly into a modern cage. Again, as a functional tool to deliver carbohydrates and fuel to the riders, they're so much better than what they had back in the day, which usually had to be unscrewed, making it much more difficult for riders to drink. I'm gonna put this steak back in the bag. I'll save the rest for later. But talking of hydration, the effects of it weren't properly understood back in the day. And that leads me on to the next thing I'm gonna show you, which is what riders used to drink a lot of. Who needs sports drinks? From 1900 to 1960, it was really common for riders in the Tour de France to consume alcohol during the race. Everything from wine, brandy, champagne, and beer were all commonplace. The riders drank alcohol for a combination of hydration and, let's be honest, probably, probably fun. Now, in the 1935 Tour de France, pretty much the entire peloton stopped on stage 17 so that they could share a cheeky libation with a local village and get boozed. But uh, one of the only riders who didn't partake in the beer drinking uh, actually went on 
to win that stage, Julian Moano. I wonder if that was a, a coincidence. Another reason why alcohol was popular is because water sanitation in the early 1900s wasn't what it is now, and there are a lot of waterborne diseases, and it was often deemed safer to be drinking alcohol than water from random fountains and streams and places along the route. I'll tell you what, I, think, I do think these lads were onto something, actually, aren't they? The benefits of consuming carbohydrates as fuel in endurance events wasn't very well understood and wasn't studied until 1939. But perhaps unknowingly, a lot of the more successful riders were actually consuming, by fault or perhaps deliberately, a large amount of carbohydrate. For example, Henri Cornet, the winner of the 1904 Tour de France, his daily diet consisted of 1.5 kilos of rice pudding and 11 litres of hot chocolate. That's a lot of carbs. Not, not much variety, but a lot of carbs. In uh, early editions of the race, riders didn't have teams, so it was actually common for them to scavenge for food en route. But later on, even as far into the 60s, it was still considered de rigueur for riders to scavenge food by raiding cafes and shops along the route. This is something that's depicted in the famous film Stars and Their Water Carriers about the Giro d'Italia. The domestiques would get off their bikes, run into a cafe and grab whatever they could and then ride back up to the team leaders such as Eddie Merckx and then give them a, a bottle of water or, um, or a baguette, or whatever they managed to, managed to find. A rider like Henri Cornet, though, wouldn't have had a musette bag like this to store his rice pudding and hot chocolate in. That's because musettes only came into being around the 1920s, around sort of the time of World War I, and they're very similar to the food bags and musette bags that were given to troops during the First World War. But something pretty cool is that the humble musette bag as a device for delivering food to riders on the go remains to this day. It's still a tradition in the sport that we see used in today's Tour de France. It's simple but very effective. It means riders can grab a bag full of food on the go without stopping and just simply loop it around their body and get what they need from it. Post ride or race, cyclists will replenish their glycogen stores, fortunately not with that, uh, and also consume some protein as well to help repair and rebuild their bodies. And this is typically done with a combination of sports, nutrition specific products such as this, but also real food. Back in the Merckx era, and also the days before that, post race or ride, it would be, you guessed it, more steak. And, um, oh, and uh, some red wine as well. Uh -huh. Oh, great. And um, oh, this would also be accompanied this time with a massive portion of pasta. I mean, those guys are absolutely living the dream, aren't they? Amazing. And, um, but not all riders did this. Uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, Henri Cornet uh, and sort of his diet, but a notable exception in this case uh, would be the great Fausto Coppi. Known as the champion of champions, Fausto Coppi won pretty much everything in the 1950s, and his diet was said to be very different from his peers. He's said to have abstained from red meat and, uh, and alcohol, and even experimented with vegetarian diets. Coppi was also the first big advocate in the peloton of a high carbohydrate diet. While his rivals were busy chomping down on steaks for breakfast and uh, you know having a pre-ride cigarette to warm up their lungs and chugging Binder Zabioni, which um, is 20 beaten egg yolks mixed with some sugar, basically egg custard raw, uh, he was eating a diet of whole grains and lots of carbs. He even had carbs throughout the race, which was rather radical at the time, so you'd have little bits of uh, 
fruit here and there, and also little sandwiches, little brioches and stuff to keep his carbohydrates up, keep his energy levels going throughout the day. It's widely thought that Coppy's high carbohydrate diet helped him push harder throughout the race and avoid bonking, unlike his carnivorous rivals. And at the time, his diet well, it was revolutionary and radical. Modern sports nutrition as we know it today really started to take off in the 1980s, thanks to companies such as Enovit with its revolutionary protein bars at the time. And they helped fuel riders such as the great Francesco Moser to feats such as the hour record. Now, riders like Moser used a combination of science, technology and nutrition to beat the feats of Eddie Merckx and the previous generation and their long-standing records. And by taking this scientific and more modern approach, the world took notice. Uh, anyway, I hope you found this look at retro nutrition interesting. I, mean, I love history, it's great. And, uh, I mean, in all likelihood, someone's probably gonna watch this video in 100 years time and I think, God, I can't believe they ate porridge for breakfast. What an idiot. Well, whatever. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, give it a thumbs up. Also, just like comment uh, down below and that. And um, mm. see you in the next one. Bye.